This conference will now be recorded. And I did want to review um, together the disclaimer. So this event is for educational and informational purposes only and served to benefit our mission. The Lupus Society of Illinois does not provide medical advice or recommendations. This information should not substitute or replace expert medical care. Before making changes to your medical care, consult your qualified health care professionals familiar with your medical condition and health status. This event is being recorded and will be archived on the Lupus Society of Illinois' website. Um, the Lupus Society of Illinois provides this free service along uh, with other educational events throughout the year, um, and we do that through the generosity of our donors and through fundraising events. Um, our junior board, or pardon me, the associate board, they just changed their name, is hosting an event coming up on May 2nd, and we also have four walks in Metro Chicago, um, and those are the dates right there. If anyone's interested in more information about other programs and services for the LSI, please um, contact me. You should all have my um, information. I'm the one who forwarded you the login information for this event. <clears throat> So the, um, I'll say again, we are hopeful that um, everyone will keep their lines muted until Dr. Ramsey Goldman opens up for questions. Um, I will try and keep your um, your lines muted until we're, it's open for questions. If you want to chat a question to me, that's fine. You can go ahead and do that. Um, and then I will either um, unmute your line or I'll just ask the question for you, whichever you prefer. Um, and without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenter today, Dr. Rosalind Ramsey Goldman, um, the Salovey Arthritis Research Society Research Professor, Professor of Medicine and Rheumatology. She received her MD from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and her MPH and Dr. PH degrees from the University of Pittsburgh. She completed her postdoctoral studies in rheumatology at the University of Pittsburgh. She's a member of LSI's Medical Advisory Board, and she, we've been proud to support her research, most recently her project, Clinical Trials Awareness Modules for the Lupus Conversations Academic Community Partnership, which she'll talk a little bit about today. And without any further ado, uh, Dr. Rosalind Ramsey Goldman. I think the timing for this, I didn't realize how perfect this was going to be because I just came back from an international meeting, uh, having the privilege to work with people who are dedicated to working in lupus uh, from all over the world. So as part of my presentation today, I'm going to tell you about things that we uh, talked about at this meeting, and I just learned about this all last week. So I thought I would tell you, it actually looks like um, if I would share the screen, I can give you the better looking screen. Uh, do you need to do that again, or we'll just use the one that I'm I'm working with now? Uh, I I'm not, you know, I don't know. It's the Let, let's the not worry that, about it. Okay. For some reason, okay, here we go. Um, so this is what I'm going to cover um, today. When I was thinking about how to share this information for, for you, with you, I was trying to decide what kinds of questions do I get asked on a regular basis, and what would I like to be able to do better as you know a provider for somebody um, with lupus. So I'm going to ask these questions. Why is the journey to diagnosis so difficult and takes so long? Why? What does it mean when you have this antibody test called ANA? And why is it important when the doctor has to interpret this in terms of deciding about your diagnosis? Many times I hear, well, I feel really bad. Why aren't the medicines working? And I have some new ideas about how to uh, share that. What you're telling us is actually a, 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 a new way for us to think about this. And as part of answering all of these questions, I'm going to incorporate some of the information that we presented from our own work here that many of you might have participated in uh, that was presented at this meeting, as well as some of the new ideas. So we're going to do the first question, which is, why is the journey to diagnosis so difficult and long? So first of all, we have to decide what is lupus 
And I thought that this description uh, was very helpful in trying to facilitate a conversation, you know, with someone who's trying to figure out if they might have lupus or not. And so this is a cover of a health magazine. And what I would say is it's a disease of self-sabotage, or basically you turn against yourself, your body turns against itself, or you, in a sense, become allergic to yourself. When you have lupus, you're riding a roller coaster, but I would tell you, close your eyes, because you don't know when you're going up or down on the roller coaster, which is when you're going to have a flare, or when you're going to feel good, or how long it's going to take to go between those two ways that you might feel. Uh, lupus is kind of like a riddle, and not, we don't always have the answers for that, and we don't know why people get it, and there's a frequent problem with not getting the right diagnosis. If you look at the picture on the right, you can see that we're talking about a castle surrounded by a moat, and usually the castle is supposed to protect you from the outside, but as you see, all of the instruments to protect you are actually going in the wrong direction against this uh, young woman who's sleeping and very tired and, and has lupus. So an example of how what it looks like when the body turns against you. Now, lupus has lots of different ways that it can uh, present itself to you and to the doctor. Any organ system can be involved, and it can happen at any time or at different times. So it may be that one time your skin is bothering you and you go see the dermatologist. Another time um, your blood count is too low, so you see a hematologist. And they may be dealing with their one problem, but nobody's putting this all together. So in my world, I'm the, the center of the universe, being the lupus rheumatologist, and I deal with all of these other doctors, and I need to coordinate all the care um, between all of these providers. And there could even be, I could even make the slide more difficult uh, and more confusing, adding more things that lupus patients frequently need. So you can see that if you see one or two of these doctors, but they don't all connect with each other, it, you can see that uh, things can be missed, and it can take a while for everybody or one person, usually the rheumatologist, to put it all together and then um, coordinate your care. So if we want to try to figure out how to make this diagnosis and try to get people to the doctor sooner, we need to think about how do we find these individuals and one of the strategies is to have a disease registry. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention actually has a National Arthritis Action Plan. And the lupus organizations, in, including those like the um, Lupus Society of Illinois, have helped lobby Congress to have line items in the budget so that we can at least start to get an accurate count of how much lupus there might be out there and what kinds of things uh, lupus patients are uh, suffering from so that we can try to make things better. So in the last decade, five lupus project sites were selected, and they were selected all over the country in order to make sure that it represents the diversity of all of the individuals who can get lupus. So the first two sites that were uh, organized were uh, in Georgia and Michigan, in the cities of Atlanta and Detroit. They also worked with the Indian Health Service in Alaska, Arizona, and Oklahoma so that American Indians and Alaska Natives um, could be counted. And then uh, the last group to um, come on board were in California and New York to expand um, the diversity and make sure that Hispanic individuals and Asian individuals were also included in this count. So what I'm going to show you here um, is a graph, but I'll explain what this means. Prevalence means that they counted up how many lupus patients they could find in a particular time period. And the parts that, the, the important things that I want to show you as you move on the graph from left to right is that men and women can be involved. So at every time point, every place that they counted, women always get this condition way more frequently than men. And when you look at the diversity of the women who can get this, 
you can see that uh, black women, Hispanic women, American Indian, Native Alaskan, and Asian women all get this um, condition more frequently than white women. And for the most part, it didn't matter what city or location people were in, that the types of individuals they found, the counts were pretty similar. There are two striking abnormalities, though. One is that women who are American Indian Native Alaskan have one of the highest bars, as well as the black women in California. We're still trying to understand that, but I think the basic message here is that non-white women get this more often than white women. The next count that they did is called incidence. So then they took a specific time period and they wanted to find all the new cases of lupus in that particular time period. This graph is very similar to what you saw before. Men and women can get this. Women get it more than men, and the same diversity of the women who are affected by this more is the same, and that, that really shouldn't be a surprise. So now we know that there, women get this more than men, and that the diversity of women and women of color are more likely to get the disease. So do they get it worse, or, or is the disease different in those individuals? And this is a different kind of um, disease registry that's mandated by the government to keep track of all the people who go into kidney failure. And on this slide, you can see that all groups can get the kidney failure and require dialysis or a transplant. But again, you see the health disparities or the diversity of the individuals who are most likely affected by this uh, severe form of lupus affecting the kidney, <clears throat> again, with African-American women being affected more than all of the other groups, and Asian, Hispanic, and Native American, um, and American Indians and Native Alaskans are the, are, have about equal amount and with white women having less. Another measure of how severe lupus can be is another database that measures lupus measures hospitalizations and specifically looking at is lupus a reason for hospitalization and even more importantly readmission to the hospital. And it looks like lupus is one of the highest rates of hospital readmission amongst all medical conditions in the United States. Anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of lupus patients get admitted to the hospital each year. This represents 140,000 hospitalizations. And one out of every six women, or 16% of these people, get readmitted within 30 days. So why do people get readmitted? I will interpret the numbers here that are listed in bold. If you're young, if you're African American or Hispanic, have public insurance, and it's measured by Medicaid or Medicare, you are more likely to get into the hospital and actually require a readmission. And these are the individuals who have the most severe forms of lupus, which is renal disease, central nervous system disease, and uh, hematologic problems, which are low blood counts or problems with clotting. And these individuals also have problems with uh, comorbidities or other things that track with lupus patients, such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes. So this information shows us that hospitalization is a central or a call to action event, so to speak, that when somebody keeps getting admitted, this is telling you that this person has severe lupus and we need to do something about it. Now this slide um, is important because it illustrates that not only um, do women get more lupus and women of color get more lupus, and not only do they get the more severe manifestations of lupus, but they actually die more often from lupus. And this is another uh, database that's used by the Centers for Disease Control, where they look at all causes of death, and then they rank them. And if you exclude um, uh, injuries, then uh, as you look at this diagram, and I will help you um, interpret it, 
the numbers mean uh, the leading causes of death from the most common to the least common. And if you look at the first line, which are the young individuals, ages 15 to 24, of all women who were reported, lupus is number seven on the list in terms of cause of death for all women. And if you look across that line, horizontally to black women and Hispanic women, it's even higher. It's the fifth leading cause of death for those two groups of women. Look at the middle line of circles. That is, uh, uh, represents women who are 25 to 34 years of age. And uh, again, for all women, lupus is ranked 11. But if you are a black woman or a Hispanic woman, you rank, lupus ranks as sixth. And we just go up one more age uh, bracket, 35 to 44. And you can see for all women, again, it's around 11. But uh, when you look at uh, black women and Hispanic women, it's nine and eight, respectively. So what I'm showing you here, uh, that the burden of lupus with increased morbidity, which was the hospitalizations and kidney disease and mortality, which I just showed you on those circle diagrams, is um, really felt the most by women and I've illustrated health disparities where women of color are the ones who are most affected. So uh, in Chicago, we're actually trying to address this burden. And Mary mentioned the Lupus Conversations Program. Uh, and the Lupus Society of Illinois is one of our partners in this. And this is, uh, program is funded by the Department of Human and Health Services, Health and Human Services, and the Office of Minority Health. And we've done a number of uh, projects, and I'm just going to show you one of them in the interest of time, um, where we're trying to improve the awareness of lupus, uh, show you the uh, information where we're working actually in the community, but there's also a healthcare provider part as well. We have another project that's funded by the National Institutes of Health that's aimed at improving the understanding of the complexity of lupus so that we can support and identify earlier diagnosis, uh, work towards more personalized care, and um, support research, and that'll be discussed later in the talk. So this is the Lupus Conversations Program, where we have a community academic partnership to increase lupus awareness in vulnerable communities. We actually have a partner in Boston who's doing the same um, project there. We use the Popular Opinion Leader, or POL model, which leverages or works with community leaders, social networks, or your connections with your, copy, with your peers to disseminate or send out health information and help you change how people think about their health and how to seek care for their health in these vulnerable communities. Again, we have two groups of popular opinion leaders here in Chicago. I'm only going to talk about the group that works in the city of Chicago. So these are 10 uh, popular opinion leaders who worked in four greater Chicago na vulnerable neighborhoods. We identified those neighbor, they identified the neighborhoods and these uh, individuals participated in four two-hour training sessions where they learned more about lupus, the uh, popular opinion leader program, how to collect research data, and then we had practice sessions. After they finished their training, in the next six months of the program, uh, the popular opinion leaders or POLs track their encounters through their social networks by recording the addresses of the places where they went and shared information um, with individuals. And because they wrote down the addresses of where they went, not where people lived, we could use something called the geographic information system so that we could evaluate the reach of their work because it helps us draw a map. So when the popular opinion leaders go out and talk in the community, they use what's called a palm card as an invitation or a conversation starter so that they can engage someone in a conversation. And this card actually happens to be from the Boston group 
So that's why it has the Lupus Foundation of America number on there, but we had a comparable card here um, in Chicago uh, from the Lupus Society of Illinois. And this is the way we start, we, and, and the uh, popular opinion leaders design their own card, which is appropriate for their uh, community. And this is how they would start talking with someone. And this is the amount of work that they did um, in six months. Um, and this represents just, again, the city of Chicago group. There was a group that worked in the suburbs. But you can see people could have anywhere from a few encounters to over 500 encounters, depending on what their social network might, might be or their context. So for example, a 500 um, person contact event might, might be a health fair or something that is occurring at a health ministry. So we think it's very important that education plays an important role in trying to help um, deal with the health disparities. And um, since I don't have uh, time, I want to cover many things. I'm not going to talk about the provider part, but we also wanted the providers to be more culturally and linguistically appropriate in their interactions with individuals uh, who have lupus. I'm going to switch to the second question um, because there's always a lot of issues regarding interpretation of tests and what does this anti-nuclear antibody or ANA or lupus test mean and why is my doctor um, fussing about it and maybe why is the researcher fussing about it. So the first thing we need to know is that just because you have a positive ANA test does not mean you have the lupus diagnosis. And we talked a bit at the beginning about misdiagnosis. So here is an example of a practice where 263 people get referred for lupus, particularly and primarily because they have this positive ANA test. But after a specialist reviews everything, only about half of them have lupus. Um, and a few of them have other related rheumatic diseases, but most patients or most of the referrals do not have lupus. And so it's really important that this test result maybe is a conversation starter to see if you might have lupus, but it doesn't mean that you actually have the disease. And so who can have this positive test? Well, if you look at all the laboratories across the country, there'd be 32 million people who have a positive ANA test, and we know that there's not that much lupus around. So there are um, normal people who would have a positive test. Certainly, almost all of the lupus patients have a positive test. Scleroderma, which is another uh, rheumatic disease, many of them have a positive test. But then other autoimmune diseases that are not necessarily related to the rheumatic diseases also have a positive ANA test, such as a certain thyroid test and a certain pulmonary or lung test. So different diseases can give you this test, and the likelihood of having a positive test increases with age, chronic infections, use of some medications, and some of those chronic conditions that I just showed you. So how do we think about this test? So I have this diagram for you. We have eight people. Four of these people have lupus, and they have an X on their tummies. And there are four people behind them that do not have the X, and they do not have lupus. So I wish that I had a perfect test, and there are very few that exist. But if we did have that perfect test, then this test would always identify those four people with the Xs on there. And it would always come up as a negative test for the people who don't have lupus, who don't have that X. Most of the time, we have imperfect tests. And that's when we have, many times they'll talk about this lupus test and they'll report a number. And so what's important here is what do we use as the number that makes you have a positive test? So usually the lowest positive test is reported as a number as 1 to 40. So if I use that number, I will find all of those four people that have lupus. So I'll be right for those. But because I accepted the lowest level positive test, I frequently can make a mistake and I'll take two of those other people without the X and say that they have a positive test and have lupus too, and that's called a false positive. So then maybe we should suggest, well, maybe you should require a higher test 
level or higher height or a higher number in order to be sure that you don't make a mistake. So another number that's frequently used is this 1 to 320. And in that case, I would only find three of the people with the X's, and I'd miss somebody. And that would be considered a false negative test. And even a normal person who does not have lupus could still have a number like this, and I'd make a mistake in that direction, too. So there's a lot of judgment and important in, in, in terms of what goes into the interpretation to know how to interpret a test if you happen to have a positive one. So if a doctor says, oh, I see there's a positive test, I want to know the number, this is um, some of what they're looking for. The other reason why this ANA test is positive is that we have checklists to see if people make a, what we call a, a definite classification of lupus. This is usually used for research purposes, but many times also used um, for helping make a diagnosis. So this is one of the older forms, and ACR here refers to one of the organizations or the first organization that tried to come up with a checklist to try to help people understand who has lupus, and the ACR means the American College of Rheumatology. And you can see uh, the list on the left are things that the patient might have that they will tell us about, we can see on the exam or we can find on testing. And then on the right-hand side are things that we can measure in the blood, which are blood counts, which be hematologic disorder, uh, Im immunologic disorder, which are uh, antibodies, but it also includes an ANA antibody. And the classification rule here is you have to have four of these things on this list to have definite lupus. So, uh, you can still have lupus and not make the four, um, you know, not get as many as four, but that's up to the judgment of the doctor. Because that was, you know, that list was made, you know, a long time ago. Um, another group uh, in uh, around 2010 or so decided that we needed to revisit this and see if we can do a better job of classifying lupus. This group is called the SLIC group, which is the Systemic Lupus International Collaborating Clinics. And for full disclosure, I am a member of that group. And at one point, I was actually the chair of that group. You can see that the list is a little bit longer than what we had before. And there are some initials for things. So I wrote out what that initial might mean. So there's many more different skin problems that can count now. You can now get additional types of ulcers, including your nose. Hair loss counts. Arthritis is still there. Serositis refers to inflammation around the heart or the lungs. You still get a, uh, credit for kidney problems, and there are a few more neurological problems that count on this list. Uh, here they listed the specific blood count abnormalities. Uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, and uh, platelets. And here you only have to have this abnormality once. In the previous list, you had to have it twice. And then they have the immunologic criteria here, which include the antibodies. And again, you see that anti-nuclear antibody as part of this list. This time, they said you had to have at least one thing from the immunologic list and at least one clinical list one on the clinical list, and you had to have at least a total of four, except if you had renal disease, and then you could be classified as having uh, lupus um, with only two. And this was important because those people were previously excluded from research studies if they wanted to participate. And finally, there's another one that is being evaluated right now. It's proposed now. It's not been accepted. And this is an int another international study, which includes the European League Against Rheumatism in partnership with the American College of Rheumatology. And again, it has a list of different kinds of areas of the body that could be affected and different labs. Um, in this one, there are several differences. 
one, you have to have an ANA before they will even classify you, uh, even consider you for classification with lupus. And in this case, depending on which area is involved, um, several things have more points than others. So if you have the renal disease, you get 10 points and that's enough and you qualify. If you only have oral ulcers or hair loss, you, that only gives you four points and you need more things wrong with you in order to reach the cutoff or the magic number of 10 to be classified with lupus. Each of these three sort of checklists, which help the doctors um, try to define what your lupus is like and how to treat you and whether you might uh, qualify for a clinical trial, all of them require this ANA test. So this is why the doctor is always asking about this particular test. This is a study from Chicago um, where we try to look at these different checklists that I just described for you. Um, and this uses the Chicago uh, Lupus Database or Registry where I have IRB permission with a patient's permission to look at their record. And um, with all of the other appropriate confidentiality procedures in place as overseen by our ethics board and internal um, review board, um, I can look at the uh, electronic medical record that's available at my institution. I realize this slide is confusing. There's one part that I want you to look at in each of the big um, rectangles. If you look at the overall detection, what I'm looking at is how many people did I find correctly? So cases are the ones that I know have lupus and controls are the ones that I know do not have lupus. Therefore, um, I'm looking for the best correct answers for cases and controls, and you see the arrow shows that, at least for the moment, the way we're able to set up the rules of finding the items on those checklists so far, the slick one is the one that appears to be performing better. We would hope that in using this, we can find people earlier and be able to characterize them better and get them to a uh, better or precise treatment. So this is work that's being done here. The next question I want to address is why do I feel bad and why are my medicines not working? I'm going to share with you some training that was done um, for peer at peer to peer education um, in lupus. And I have these slides courtesy of my colleague, Dr. Sam Lim from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, it really helped me think about and explain when the doctor says the lupus is active or the lupus has caused damage and how to figure out whether medicines might be working for you or not. So I'm gonna show you an example of a situation where there's no lupus. And I'm gonna use some analogies to try to illustrate the point. This is an example of a forest and I want you to think of the forest as your body and the fire that you see here is the immune system. And here the fire is doing something good. It's everything is in control. It's not hurting the forest. It's not hurting your body at all. It's just cooking the food. So here is a lupus flare or lupus activity. Here you see the fire, the immune system is out of control and it's attacking the forest or your body. So if you have a flare, the doctor's gonna to wanna to treat you, and so they wanna put that fire out, so they're using all this water and they're just gonna knock out that fire. So the water here is an example of your lupus medication. So think about if you have had kidney disease, your kidneys are flaring, the doctor's given you all of these medications, and I'll just list one, which is prednisone, and he's trying to knock out all that inflammation. So if you keep having episodes like that, after many years of these repeated flares, you're gonna have damage. And here is a problem with the forest, which is your body, which now has damage. When it's this case, if you have repeated flares of your kidney, it may not work anymore. And so then you need dialysis or transplant. So this flare caused this damage. 
So this flare was, it was, you know, this is what the fire left or the immune system that was out of control. And then I had to put out that fire with the water, but now there's no more inflammation. If I keep giving you water or in this case, prednisone, it's not going to help get this any better. So that may be why sometimes you're still taking medicine. You, it wouldn't be helping your kidney disease. And so that's not going well, but you might be needing that medicine for some other problem related to your lupus. But sometimes you can recover from damage. For example, I can make things a little bit better if you have dialysis, and I, maybe I can make things uh, much better if you get a transplant. It's still not complete healing because then you have to deal with those issues related to those treatments. But at least compared to when I first started doing this, there wasn't as much or we weren't as successful with dialysis or transplants, and now I can see people um, being able to cope and this was one way of knowing that there is hope on the horizon that we are able to do better. And what I'm going to share with you at the that I of the things that I learned at the new at the meeting last week was additional areas where you can feel hopeful that we're going to be making advances in the treatment of lupus. So just to summarize this section, uh, when we're thinking about activity or damage, this can may help you understand why your symptoms may not go away completely over time and why the medicines that may have been helpful before are not so helpful right now. This may also explain why you may be told your labs look fine, but you still feel horribly. Um, and that's because there are other things that are going on um, that the lab is not measuring. And whether it's activity or damage, both of these things are important and they're real issues that your medical team needs to address, but they might need um, different treatments. So that's what I'm going to address now, which will include some of the updates from the recent um, international meeting. So before I went to the meeting, when I thought about treatment, I thought, well, the goals of therapy are to stop that inflammation or that disease activity, and I didn't want you to have any damage. And that I, it was my job to manage the potential side effects of the medicines that I gave you. And I was hoping that the medicines on the horizon might give me more targeted treatment based on what was really going on from lupus um, rather than the global immunosuppression like we get from steroids. So this is a new concept that was shared uh, by, um, with, my, with my colleagues from Duke, where they, Duke University in North Carolina, where they suggested that you think about two types of lupus symptoms. So type one is the uh, stuff that we've probably been referring to all along. Synovitis is joint pain, rash, serositis is the inflammation around the heart or the lungs, and then nephritis is the kidney problem, and this is where you get your standard immunosuppression. But patients always tell me the things that bother them, either as much as those other things or maybe more, are the fatigue or the tiredness, the myalgias or the aching, the mood disturbance where they could be anxious or depressed, and they can't think straight, which is the cognitive dysfunction. So let me show you pictures of those because those things might require other strategies in terms of treatment. So here are the things that would be typical type one lupus, the typical inflammation. You see the butterfly rash, you see a discoid rash where it's destroyed some of the hair, the next one shows an oral ulcer. The slide under that shows you arthritis. And then the other pictures at the bottom are the things that I can measure in the laboratory. So that, so the uh, picture, the green picture on the left lower side of the slide shows you what an ANA might look like um, under the microscope. The x-ray shows inflammation around the heart and in the lungs. And then the gray, um, a kidney biopsy shows you that this is what I could see under the microscope if you had a kidney biopsy. Now, type 2 lupus are what I call intangibles. These are the things that are much harder to measure. It's pain, memory thief, or lupus fog is another way people talk about it, depression, and that fatigue and that we really need to think of these as lupus symptoms too, and that these may not necessarily refer 
uh, respond to the inflammation uh, um, immunosuppression medicines that we use uh, for the type 1 part. So this makes people think differently about how they're going to take care of you and what we should do from the research standpoint so that we can uh, improve clinical care. So the implications for care here are that we can we should direct therapy to manage those type 2 symptoms. We shouldn't be using prednisone all the time for every single type of lupus symptom. Plus, we have to have improved communication acknowledging the impact of how type 2 symptoms affect your day. And from the research standpoint, we need to develop new treatments or better strategies to deal with those symptoms like fatigue. We have to use more of what we call patient-reported outcomes uh, in research, and there are surveys that we can use so we can measure how you feel and if we've made a difference. And then uh, ultimately, we would hope that there could be something that we could measure somewhere um, in the blood or in the urine or some other type of uh, measurement so that we could uh, uh, identify even better what those type 2 symptoms are and if they're responding to treatment. So I've revised that um, important concept slide that I showed you before, and in bold, the goals of therapy now have to include, we have to direct therapy to manage type 2 symptoms, and we need to manage those side effects or toxicities of the immunosuppressive drugs, which means don't overuse them and try not, and really work hard not to overuse prednisone. And from the research standpoint, we need to um, develop some uh, new treatments to um, help deal with those symptoms. So first, we'll talk about the type 1 um, information that was shared at the meeting. So this one is not new, um, but it sets up the next slide. And the first new medicine that was approved for treatment in lupus in 50 years was done in 2011. This was the Belimumab or Benlista study, where you're required to have two studies that show that the drug works. And these are the two studies. And if you look at the two bars, the tan bar are the people who got standard of care plus a placebo, and the blue and the purple bars are the people who got a low and a higher dose of the study drug, which was uh, Belimumab, which has been um, with the brand name Benlista. And you can see that if people got the study drug, they did better, and the dose that was approved was the one in the purple bar because that was the one that was consistent across both of those studies. And so this is what led the FDA to approve that drug. In approving the drug, several questions came up. One was this was now given by an infusion. Would it be possible to give it another way? And these are two new things that were uh, uh, that have come out in the last year and shared at, at this meeting. One is that you can now self-inject this material, and that has been approved, and that has been available over the last year. But the other question that came up was whether belimumab worked as well in all patients, and in particularly uh, black patients. Um, and because black patients, as you saw earlier, have more severe disease and suffer more consequences from uh, their severe disease, uh, the study was done specifically looking at whether this drug would work in those individuals, and this study was called EMBRACE. Uh, this was just presented last week, so I don't have the specific slides, but this is my summary, which said that the patients who had the most severe disease responded to the study drug just like everybody else. The problem was not everybody got the improvement that was required um, in order to uh, push the needle forward so that everybody could get this drug and we could feel confident that it works in these individuals. So the company is still looking at um, this information so that to see if they can get at least provisional approval from the FDA so that we know who this drug would work in. So the lessons learned from this <laughs> clinical trial are really important. It highlights the importance of the clinical trial design and the diversity of who's in the trial. 
because it's really important to get it right so you get the right drug to the right person at the right time. And I'm just going to show you how the drug got approved in the self-injected or subcutaneous study. If you look at the orange uh, line, you see it's higher than the blue line. And at every time, almost every time point, those people did better, and those are the people who got the drug. And this is why this drug got approved in this other formulation. So you can either get it as an infusion, which is the original study, or the self-injected. And it doesn't look like there's a difference between the two for the, anybody who's trying the drug. There was a review about kidney disease. That's the, the most common bad thing that happens um, to lupus patients. There are two drugs that are on the market. Um, one is called cyclosporin, and another is called tacrolimus or Prograf. Uh, those two drugs um, are being used in lupus. The drug that I'm showing you here, vulclosporin, is what we call a next generation of those drugs. This was altered slightly chemically to be more effective and hopefully have less side effects, or at least not increased side effects. If you look at this, people got their standard of care plus either a placebo or a low or a high dose of the study drug. And so some people got better um, because the regular treatments do work some of the time. But if you look at the people who got the study drug, they did much better. And particularly the low dose, which is good because usually low doses of the study drug uh, will go on to uh, have less side effects. And because of the results of this study, this is currently um, in what we call that phase three or the last stage of getting a drug approved if they could show it again that the drug works. There is a drug that's out there that's already approved for psoriatic arthritis. So that's a skin and arthritis condition. And because the abnormalities in that condition can also be seen in lupus, they have studied that in, in lupus. This is a complicated name called ustekinumab. The important part here is that people with lupus got this drug, and they would be represented in the purple bar, and the people in the gray bar got their standard of care, but they got the placebo. And you can see almost twice as many people did as well with getting this other drug without an increase in side effects. And so this drug, too, is moving into the phase three clinical trials and is currently enrolling patients, and there are probably sites in Chicago where you could get access to this trial if you were interested. Let's see if I can get this to work. Okay. Um, this is making me go to the end. Okay. So there are three other drugs that are being that were presented at the meeting last week. One is a drug called baricitinib that's already approved for rheumatoid arthritis. And because it worked for arthritis, it was studied in lupus for skin and joint problems. Again, showed very promising results in relieving those two symptoms. So that's going into clinical trials. There is another drug, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce that one, but it starts with um, where it tries to regulate the immune system better where it turns off where the immune system is overactive and it does not interfere with the immune system's ability to fight infection. And this one is currently being studied. One um, different strategy is mesenchymal stem cells, which is funded by the Lupus Foundation of America, the National Institutes of Health, and the Medical University of South Carolina. This is for refractory disease. And there are only seven sites in the country that are performing this study. And we are doing it here in, at Northwestern. We're the only site in the Midwest. And we will um, leave you some information for resources if you might be interested in the study. But the first six patients that were done at the Medical University of South Carolina, five or six of them, had a really good response. And they're continuing to be followed. So this is another opportunity, and again, um, unique to Chicago. We're the only site here that might be able to do this study, and this is my um, IRB approval. I did want to just mention a few things about the trials that are looking at that type 2 lupus, or the things that bother the patients the most, 
and again, a unique trial that's available only uh, at Northwestern is the Lupus Intervention Fatigue Trial, or LIFT, which is currently enrolling patients. It uses behavioral and educational strategies to help you deal with fatigue. And at the meeting that I went to, they started talking about a multi-center trial that's being planned to help deal with that lupus fog. And they're using a medication that's already out there and known with a known safety profile. It actually measures blood pressure, but there's some evidence to suggest that it might prevent brain damage and might be helpful in lupus fog. So there'll be more about this one. So now people are trying to pay attention to this type 2 um, lupus. And this is the IRB approved material that we have for the LIFT trial. Um, and this will be uh, on the website. Um, but this is just a, a brief summary of what this trial is like, what you would be doing in the trial. Um, and here's a phone number that you can call uh, if you might be interested uh, in participating. One more comment about treatment. We focus mostly on lupus-specific things, but lupus patients get other things too, and they're more at risk for fractures, a small increased risk of cancer, and certain kinds of cancer. They have an increased risk of heart attacks and strokes, and they definitely have an increased risk of infection. So this is why it's so important that all the doctors coordinate the care. So in addition to getting what you need for your lupus, you're getting these other things done in a preventive or pro proactive way to minimize the complications from these side effects. And you'll have this available um, you know, um, on the recording to go back and look at these uh, in more detail so that you can go over those with uh, your providers. And then the other thing that will be available to you are these resources. One, all, all the clinical trials that are available in lupus are on the clinicaltrials.gov website. If you want more information about the mesenchymal stem cell study, this is the uh, uh, website from the Lupus Foundation of America talking about it. Uh, the Lupus Society of Illinois has a lot of good um, information about studies not only done at Northwestern, but all over Chicago, and they can help you with those referrals. And then you also um, can look at our website here at Northwestern um, to see all the things that we do. Our goal here is to improve the lives of those individuals who uh, suffer from lupus, and we partner together with all of you so that we find the cure for this disease. So I know I've gone almost a full hour, but I'd be more than happy to address some of your questions. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. That was a lot of information, and I know I have a couple questions, but I think we'll open up the, the lines now. So um, does anyone have a question? Can you talk a little bit more about the medicine for the brain fog? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm I'm gonna mute the lines again, except for um, Dr. Ramsey Goldman. I'm gonna open up your line. Okay. Okay. So the medication for the brain fog test is actually a blood pressure medicine. It's a type of medicine called um, an ACE inhibitor an angiotensin receptor, uh, 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 it's a blood pressure medicine. The common names for it are called uh, like lisinopril or ramipril. What they did was they gave those medicines to rats and mice, and they measured how they measure brain function and how it works in those animals. And when they got that medication, they did better. They have examined this in the laboratory, and because we use that medicine actually in terms of our treatment. Now that they would, they decided that we have enough information that they would design a trial to see if that would make a difference, not only to help the blood pressure, not only to protect the kidney, but also that it might improve your brain function. So this is what we call repurposing medications. So we don't necessarily have to do all the safety studies because we already know the safety profile of this medication. It's already used for other indications for lupus, and now we can see if we can use it to target a specific problem um, that really confounds a lot of us, um, just from the treatment side and also from the patient side. So, so the I, have, person, 
Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I just have a sort of a follow-up question about that. So a lot of the lupus drugs now are are not developed for lupus, but they still are used in lupus, like the chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And so how is that different than the drug you're just talking about, that it's Um, being repurposed? Right. Uh, It's it's the same. Okay. Um, The difference would be that um, as part of standard of care, People are, you know, either getting this drug or not getting this drug, um, either to control their blood pressure, and there are choices for what you could use for that. But people are not necessarily measuring um, the effects on the brain. So what this study would do is that if somebody would be on, you know, would be given this drug specifically for uh, the brain issue or the confusion issue. And then they would be measuring that to see if it made a difference. Right now, they, we don't. Uh, that hasn't been specifically measured when this drug is used. So that's why we don't. That's why we don't have that information. Um, but uh, lupus doctors use drugs because we want to make you better. And right. so if we only use the drugs that, that are approved, we wouldn't be doing our job. So yes, we do use things off label, but this. The difference would be this study would be a systematic um, way of looking at whether or not we made a difference for this particular symptom. Because if it made a difference, we would maybe prescribe it for that indication too, not just if you have high blood pressure. Right. And then it probably makes it easier for insurance and is just standard of care across the board, right? Yeah. So that's the, okay. All right, so that I'm it gonna, makes it easier for us to, um, you know, get access so, to it. Right. Okay. I'm going to unmute the lines again. Um, does anyone have a question? Yes. Is there any way you can send out a list of the medications that um, would treat the type two symptoms that you described? I know. Like, I'm waiting for the Easter block. I'm going to mute lines as well just because there's a lot of background noise, and then I'm just going to um, unmute Dr. Ramsey Golden. There you go. So the question was, are there a list? Is there a list, or can I give you the list of the medicines for type 2? Actually, that doesn't exist. Um, I think that all of us have the medications that we uh, use, um, for let's say depression Uh, we don't have a medicine specifically for lupus fog Uh, we do use plaquenil for uh, fatigue as part of the general treatment Um, but there may be other things that you can do that are not drugs that can help you um, deal with those issues and that's part of what we're doing in that lift study um, we are using, we're not using medications to deal with fatigue. We're giving you other strategies of how to deal with it. So, for example, people, um, let's say they try to deal with stress, try to do mindfulness or meditation, uh, they do restorative yoga. Um, you will see all over the news that you got to be more physically active and exercise. But if you have chronic pain and you have lupus and you're tired, that's a hard thing to do. Um, so our program, one of the strategies is to help people figure out how to do that and to do it safely. So um, those kinds of services are frequently not covered by payers. So people who have their own resources can come up with uh, some of the things that we're suggesting, but it's hard to get, um, you know, get that covered even harder than getting some of the medicines I want to use covered. So this is why it's so important that this recognition of type 2 lupus gets out there because that supports um, the importance of studying it and documenting what we can do to make you feel better so that we can offer that treatment to everybody, not just in a trial. So I wish I had a better answer for you, and maybe in a few years I will, based on my trial. But I'm yeah. hopeful that other people are doing similar things because um, just like that, you saw that 
I told you about six different drugs. I could have told you about more, and I already, you know, used up a lot of time. Um, yeah. We got to get the type two strategy out there so that people who are studying it recognize how important it is so that I can give you a better answer to that question the next time I speak with all of you. That said, it's very exciting that there's as many drugs in the pipeline as there are now, uh, because that wasn't the case previously, right? Yes. This, I, I this think is all really other, good news. Right. And I think that, I mean, we, we're, um, we have cautious optimism. I mean, they've, they've actually tested a lot of drugs over, you know, not a lot, but certainly more than when I first started. Since mm -hmm. the 1990s, we probably had about 15 failures, but the lupus community of researchers um, is learning with each trial so that we get better. That's why I had sort of the lessons learned piece um, on the, uh, you know, new studies related to belimumab that we are getting smarter at designing the trials, mm -hmm. um, but we also need to make them more diverse so mm -hmm. that everybody's included so we know who should get the drug. Mm -hmm. So there are several that are very promising right now. Uh, there are, it's, they're in what's called, they completed what's called phase two, which is, and you need to get through phase three to, to try for approval. Phase two means that you, demonstrated that it could have a good effect. Um, it's, those are usually relatively small studies. Phase three, you have to do two separate studies. You have to do more people, and you have to, again, show that your um, therapeutic or your treatment strategy works, and at the same time, you're collecting more safety data because you need to be sure that if you're giving somebody a new treatment, you're not causing more trouble. Right. And how to, you know, advise somebody if you're giving them a new treatment, what to look out for. Right. Kind of like how they know with steroids, you have to watch your um, for osteoporosis, right? So Correct. they're trying to, exactly. they're doing, they're looking at everything. And then that is also the issue with the African-American and Ben Lista, right? They just didn't have enough people in the study? Yes. So they okay, did. to get past. Yes. Uh, that's a quick answer. The answer is yes. Um, with the international study, it's not that it didn't work in African American or black individuals. They just had so few people that they could not say yes or no. Okay. And so um, it's just important. It was an important lesson that I think the whole research community learned that you got to be inclusive, and that means you have to think more carefully about how you design the trials, how you talk to people about trials. That's part of the work that we're doing with you you know, trying to mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. as part of the next phase of that lupus conversations of community work is we want the patient's voice. Um, we've actually held focus groups with your help. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're actually looking at that information today because we want to work with the community to develop the right kind of educational materials that are relevant to you. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea was, yes, we need new things, but we have to work together to get them. Right. Okay. There was actually a chat question. What's the highest titer of a positive ANA? And this person's is consistently one, one twenty eight, one two eight zero. Yes. So that's a high one, but I've seen them higher. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't so, really put a number on how high. Uh, the highest I've seen is five thousand two hundred and eighty. Oh my um, goodness. But let me make a comment about that. The ANA titer level makes you, the higher it is, the more suspicious you are that it's lupus. But it doesn't tell you that you are going to have the severe form of lupus. That's why we have to do those other immunologic tests because they actually help us um, figure out which patient might be at more risk to have the more severe types of lupus. So that the high level gets your attention, of course, but it's not just one test result. It's a combination of all of those other test results and what you tell me, even if it wasn't on any of those checklists that are important in terms of um, making the diagnosis and coming up with the right treatment and monitoring it to see if the treatment is working, but also not causing its own problems. 
Right. Okay. All right. I'm going to unmute everyone and let's um, let's see if there's any questions. Anyone else have any questions? Okay. I have an I have a question then. Um, oops. And I muted Dr. Ramsey Golden. A um, there's a, a test for lupus, and um, I'm just curious as to if you want to share your thoughts about the test for lupus um, and whether or not you feel like all of these new advancements in the test for lupus that you went through the criteria and um, do you think that's going to shrink the amount of time it takes to diagnose lupus? Um, so I think I understand the question. Mm -hmm. um, things that I did not talk about, as you know, I had probably too much to share with yeah. you today yeah. and there's plenty more. Right. Um, there are other research activities going on to try to get better tests to either find lupus earlier or say you don't have lupus, which is equally important, mm -hmm. uh, and also to monitor lupus. What we think is uh, uh, what we think is happening in that area is that there as I mentioned before not there is not going to be one test that's going to give us the answer but panels of tests so okay. that's where the new work is going what combination of tests better ways to measure things including being able to measure even very very small amounts of some things that in blood that previously we could not find that might be important. So what you may hear now are this word panel of tests. Um, there's no one that's been the big winner yet, um, but I think that's partly where things are going to help with diagnosis um, and to help with monitoring. Because okay. kidney disease is the most common bad thing there are separate panels to try to find kidney involvement in response to treatment. Okay. So there's lots more work going on, which I, you know, would have made me talk for another hour, and I didn't really want to do that. <laughs> we'll so have to do that. I have really kept you way past dinner anyway. Oh, no, I know. And actually, um, Kim, who'd add the question about the titer, is yes. it a concern if that never goes down, the titer? No. no. No, okay. Just because your test, okay. ANA test is positive, doesn't mean, doesn't bode poorly for you. Because once you have lupus, you've got it. Basically, that's what it says. Mm -hmm. um, we have been able to document that some people can make it go away, but um, that's not generally helpful to say if you're going to do well. Um, so really, once we know you're positive and once you have a lupus diagnosis, the ANA test does not need to be repeated. The kinds of things that are more helpful to tell us you're sick with lupus or you might get sick with lupus or you're getting better are to measure the DNA antibody test and complement levels called C3 and C4. They are helpful in some people, but not everybody. And that's why we're doing all this work with all of these other companies, me or and lots of other people too, um, to get better tests than what we generally have available now that um, coincide with how good you feel or how bad you feel or might tell me when you're going to do badly so I can do something before you get sick. Okay. Okay. And then... Um, I have a question. Okay. Um, go Go ahead, Rich. No, go ahead with your Our question. Our 24 year old son was diagnosed. Our 24 year old son was diagnosed with uh, lupus a year ago. And because of their such little, uh, little research on males, do you suggest a second opinion? Or how um, common is that? I would say 10% uh, of all lupus patients are men. Men tend to be sicker, but not all. I would always encourage somebody to get a second opinion. Uh, lupus is, uh, you know, not a common diagnosis, and it's always good to get more feedback um, to make sure that the strategy is correct. 
um, at, here at Northwestern. We're here to help, and, and many of my colleagues feel the same way, that, um, you know, if uh, you get confirmation that the strategy is correct, that's great. Um, if there's another way to think about it or other things that might be helpful that can be added, we can certainly work with the doctor that you have already. Um, so it doesn't mean you have to switch doctors. We're always here to help, and most of my colleagues will feel the same way, that we're always here to help and make things better. Okay, thank you very much. We'll be okay. in touch. If, if you are looking for um, a second opinion or a referral to a doctor, uh, you can contact the Lupus Society of Illinois and we can um, help as well, uh, help with you finding someone. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's, it's almost time to go and we did get um, a question. I'm not sure, Dr. Ramsey Goldman, you're gonna have a chance to answer it. Uh, so I think I'm gonna forward Isabel's question over to you separately. Um, because it is 7.15 and um, I know that we've we've taken up quite a bit of your time. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining the call. Thank you for your questions. Dr. Ramsey Goldman, this is um, wonderful information. I'm sure I'm going to have other questions after the video is posted, so I'll forward those on to you. I'll, I'll ask people to forward me any questions and I will get them over to you. Um, the next educational event will be in the next, maybe within the next three months, and um, I will make sure that everybody uh, who was registered for this will get an invite to that as well. So, um, Dr. Ramsey Goldman, thank you so much. Uh, we, I really appreciate it. This was a really wonderful presentation. And thanks everybody for calling in. Um, and we will be in touch for the next uh, educational event. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share new things. I know I gave you a lot of information. I guess the bottom line message is there's a message of hope. I, that I is, you know, that is, yeah, I totally agree. I think that this is all really exciting developments. And again, this is being recorded, so we will, um, well, I'll send all that, I'll send the, the recording out so people can take a look at it. And again, follow up with any questions you might have. I'll forward them on to Dr. Ramsey Goldman. Um, and again, just thanks everybody for making this such a wonderful event. And if you've chatted me a question, I will, um, I will get answers to those questions and send them back to you. Uh, does that sound good? Um, all right. Thanks everybody so much. Have a wonderful evening and a great weekend. Mary? Yes, ma'am. Are we the only ones left? <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> Um, you know what, can I...